My guest on the program is Cynthia Mbamalu, a dedicated human and gender rights advocate and a development practitioner, a lawyer by profession with special focus on comparative constitutional law. She specializes in human and women rights advocacy, constitution, election and governance issues, and is director of programs at Yaga Africa. Is there such a thing as gender equality? Are lawmakers mistaken equality of the sexes with equality of spouses? What was wrong with these bills? So much so that they got such a resounding no from so many lawmakers. And the most pressing question of all, what next for Nigerian women? Cynthia Mbamalu, welcome to Dateline Abuja. Thank you for having me on the show. <laughs> you know, I saw you at the protest and I remember the, the feeling on that day it was mostly sadness. A lot of us had cried yes. before, before we got there. <laughs> and I remember Auntie Abiola was trying to get all of us to, you know, be in the mood, mood. and remember that we're, the protest is for a reason and, yeah. and we have to focus on what it is that the reason for this protest is. But a lot of us weren't really shocked at the actions of the National Assembly at the mm -hmm. time when the gender equality bill had to be stepped down for a bit, you know, because oh, they needed to get more clarification on a lot of things. A lot of women, myself included, got the message. We kind of got, okay, this, yeah, is where, this, is what, mm -hmm. this is where this National Assembly is headed. But talk to us about how you felt. You've been doing women advocacy for so long. You're a constitutional lawyer. Talk to us a bit about the impact this decision has had on women in Nigeria. Yeah, you know, when you started with the mood um, on the protest ground, a lot of us, the day of the voting, it almost seemed like just watching the vote and hearing the lawmakers scream no you know there's something about when someone says no to you in a nice way you would feel um not so hurt but when someone says no to you in a mocking and a very undermining way it almost looks like your agitation and your issues did not have value and, and i think that was what was really hurtful that the lawmakers in constraining this especially in the house of representatives the way they vehemently rejected the proposals and the way they made a mockery of some of the proposal just showed that um, showed that our lawmakers did not really understand the issues. They did not really understand issues around women. They understand the importance of the constitution and did not understand the principles within the constitution. And, and, I, and I always want to make reference to the preamble in the constitution. It talks about how we've resolved to give ourselves a constitution that promotes welfare and security of everyone. And then the preamble mentions upholding principles of equality, freedom, and justice. And if you come to chapter two of the constitution, you see it's also enunciated free freedom, equality, and justice. Equality was used in the Constitution. So if, if you think about the several times issues on gender has either been thrown out, there's always been argument around the use of the word equality and things like, oh, the women can be equal to men. That was one of the, uh, the protests against the GO bill, Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill in December last year. The two senators stood up and said the title Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill is presuming that women and men are equal and within the religions, the dominant religions in Nigeria, women and men are not equal. Let's go into this bill in itself. Yeah. A lot of people have criticized these lawmakers. I'm going to get to what next in mm -hmm. a bit. But let's talk a bit about, you know, the advocacies that may have gone into ensuring that these bills didn't fail. Were there any such advocacies? Oh yeah, there were um, lots. In fact, um, the bill on the reserve seat, for instance, uh, so after post the public hearing, a lot of women-led groups and CSOs made presentations on women. However, at the committee level, surprisingly, when they were considering bills, there was no bill that was adopted on women representation in the parliament. That's national and state assemblies. No bill. And all the bills that were proposed were proposing 35% affirmative action or two-third, um, at least not less than one-third, with several levels of proposals. So people drafted bills learning from what other countries had. But those bills did not make it in. So the reserve seat bill was a product from the conversation from the committee, from the Constitution Review Committee. When they noticed there was nothing, the female legislators said, how can we have nothing for women representation in the government when this is very 
very important. And there was a conversation of what proposal would work. So this reserve seat bill was an agreement by both the men and women in the House of Representatives to draft something that would not be easily challenged and thrown out, which is why this bill had over 80 lawmakers as co-sponsor in the House, including the Speaker. So I don't know what level of advocacy you need again, because if you can have as much as over 80, close to 100 by the time it was in second reading, sign up to a bill. It shows that the women, the lawmakers in the House of Reps, they had to lobby their, co um, their colleagues. So we'll move on to another thing that we asked for, um, appointments. Appointments. 30%. Appointments. Appointment, yeah. And, and, and another percentage that we're asking for in political party, uh, for, leadership. In politi political party leadership. Yeah. These things look like things that we want. We yeah. want them. Why would that things be? Things that Nigeria needs. Nigeria needs. Yeah. These are things that are good. But why would it be a disadvantage to a man? Because it's the same thing. It's about um, access well, to power and resources. Well, let's talk about the for first them. one. The thirty percent appointment yes. means that seventy percent will be men. Men. Yeah. So why no, we're actually pushing for thirty-five percent, but they reduced it to, to yeah. twenty so and 20 ten. Twenty and ten. Yeah. So, so why would that be a threat? And um, because for them, if you're doing thirty-five percent, it means some states will be presented by women, and the question is, whose state would have to provide a woman? So, what happens to the men in that who state? feel that they ought to be the next minister? Or the next commissioner at the state level because the, the appointments are done by quota. done by yes you and know we federal okay. character yes, needs to yes. be complied with so you need to go across the states so for them the question was 35 percent hmm. so whose states would be giving would be producing a, a woman and what about the men in those states who believe is their turn to become ministers or commissioners so that was the threat and for them because once you look at that it's a major challenge and for political, political parties, parties for political parties because you know um Party leadership is so powerful that they control everything in the party. They determine things around party guidelines for primaries, who and who has access to the ballot. A lot of things happen. And for them, um, beyond the woman leader role, which they love to give women, because they want you women to go and mobilize, mobilize. people to mm -hmm. vote for them, is the question if you have more women, 35%, it already means that the men that have been in the party, those are people that say, I've been in this party, it's my turn to be chairman or to be chairman for Northwest, you know, they also do leader and coach, um, deputy chairs for the different geopolitical zones, the secretary and all of this. So I've been in the party paying my dues. Why would I be, why would that, this my dream to lead be limited to a woman coming in? Because for them, this is a restriction to the ability to lead within the party. And the other part is if you put women in, they will take over. You hear this happening, all this, you hear these conversations going. And in, we've heard some of the lawmakers say without, uh, without any shame that, oh, women are taking over in the homes. They now want to come and take over our political parties and take over National Assembly. And we don't know how to explain to them. We don't want to take over. We just want to work with you as equal partners in development to be part of the system. So for them, it's the fact that if you put women as exec at executive position, 35%, it means you're going to have more women at the closed meetings where decisions are made around who and who gets tickets. And there's a likelihood that these women will be pushing more women or more candidates that the average old patriarch politician would not want to support. Because there's also a tendency for a woman to actually ask, what value does this candidate bring? Can we bring candidates that would add value to the political space? And for them, that is a threat to their power, to decision to make. You know, they make all decisions in closed doors, late hours. But if you bring women, you have to review all some of your plans. You can't have women at part, as part of your executive and your sexually harassing candidates, female candidates, and the women will sit back and watch you. Or you're going after their daughters and they'll sit back and watch you. So there's a lot of things that has a lot of practices that are really major threats to our democratic development that they've had for so long that they believe infusing women would get more women speaking on those issues and would expose those things they like to hide. So for them, it's a threat to their position, which, which they believe, I, I don't think we want that. They always tell it and they always say, it's our party. Let us decide. Don't use the constitution to, to force, force us, us to do things. Well, Cynthia, you know, when it comes to these kinds of conversations, it, it doesn't end. It's a conversation it, it, that yes. goes on forever. True. But I want to thank you so much for being with us on Dayla and Abuja. And good luck with the advocacy that you do. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks to the media for always keeping these issues out. I'm out there in the front burner. We need it. <laughs> thank you.